Hi, uh, my name is Yu. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of, Anth of Anthropology um, here at Yale. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce and moderate this panel on imperial swine and settler colonialism. Um, we'll have, uh, we are delighted to have all um, three historians on this panel. Our first speaker would be um, Marcy Norton. Marcy is um, Associate Professor of History at George Washington University and the author of Sacred Gifts, Profane Pleasures, A History of Tobacco and Chocolate in the Atlantic World. Um, our second speaker would be um, Robin Derby. Robin is Associate Professor of Latin American History at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her current book project treats demonic animal um, apparitions in Haiti and the Dominican Re Republic and is entitled Fera Bestia, Sorcery as History in the Haitian Dominican Borderlands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me begin by thanking Gabe and Jim and Alden um, for their effort and their imagination and putting together such a marvelous conference and, and everyone else who has helped make this possible and um, the fabulous papers that I've heard so far. So there was no way that I couldn't begin my contribution about pigs without talking about what for me is probably the most arresting evidence I've found during my research on human-animal relationships on both sides of the Atlantic world beginning in 1492. This tale of three pigs was interspersed in uh, the account of the conquistador turned chronicler Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo's um, a description of a maroon rebellion and then suppression of it in, uh, in the island of Hispaniola. Um, and here we are, Hispaniola. Um, and so in 1543, a group of Spanish soldiers were pursuing the maroon rebels in Cibao Mountain region in what is today the Dominican Republic when they came across three pigs. Oviedo didn't write this, but it wouldn't be surprising if the pigs approached the soldiers with gentle curiosity. Whatever their demeanor, the soldiers killed them as they would have any of the numerous feral pigs roaming in the countryside. And here is where we are. Um, however, the Spanish men soon discovered that the pigs had a human <laughs> companion who was greatly bereaved at their loss. This man, and I now have reason to think that he would have been native to northern South America and enslaved as part of the um, exponentially increasing slave trade, indigenous slave trade in this period, though in a recent article I identified him as Taino, but I think that's now wrong. Um, Oviedo explained that this Indian had survived in the wilderness through a special relationship with the three formerly feral pigs, two males and a female. The man and his pigs would go hunting for wild pigs in the way that Europeans hunted prey with dogs, um, where one pig would track, the other one would seize, and one would assist, and the man would give the final thrust of death with a make-do spear, Let's see, contemporary, um, and then preside over the ritual distribution of the carcass, as was done in traditional European hunts in Europe. Um, and Oviedo explained that when there wasn't available prey, he would make a barbecue for himself, um, or he would, he would, after, when there was prey, they would barbecue for himself and salt the flesh for several days' consumptions. When prey was not readily available, the man foraged for roots and plants, which he ate and shared with his porcine company. At night, wrote Oviedo, the said Indian went to bed among that bestial company, petting for hours one and then the other, devoted to the swine, la porcesa. After seeing his beloved pig slaughtered, the man lamented to the three soldiers. According to Oviedo, he said, those pigs gave me life and maintained me as I maintained them. They were my friends and good company. One I gave this name, the other was called such and such, and the female pig was called so and so. Reflecting on this episode, Oviedo was amazed by this, what he called this great novelty, in which pigs being hunted were converted into being hunters, and he credited the Indian being a rational animal and a human man with ingenuity for teaching those beasts in hunting, bringing a trainable friendship to that occupation, and convincing his pigs to kill others they came across because their master did not have love for these others. 
Yet he was also scornful of the choice to flee from men and be content living with beasts and being bestial. A conventional reading might be to suggest that Oviedo was revealing the anthropocentrism typical of Europeans of his age, and that the Indians' closeness to the pigs challenged the European sense of hierarchy in which men should stand separate and above animals. But I would like to propose instead that Oviedo's interest and confusion and reaction um, was uh, based in the fact that for him, this episode was notab notable because it produced confusion between categories generated by modes of interaction of husbandry and hunting. I define a mode of interaction as a structure comprised of entrenched customs, patterns, and behaviors and institutions that organize how people relate to and think about animals over the long durée, and most importantly for today's talk, produce the possibilities or lack thereof for interspecies inter subjectivity. Modes of interaction are ontologically productive, engendering taxonomies and knowledge, and refract and reinforce other organizing structures, class relationships, economic institutions, patriarchy. I will necessarily be brief and schematic in this presentation, but I developed this framework more fully um, in some of these publications. The deep histories that explain both Oviedo's reaction to this episode and the behaviors and views of the Indian man require an understanding of both European and lowland South American modes of interaction. In Europe, at least since the high Middle Ages, these two structures are hunting and husbandry, which coexisted and influenced each other, but were opposed in the kinds of interspecies intersubjectivities they produced. In indigenous lowland South America, which from a cultural vantage point included the islands of the Caribbean, the complementary structures were, to use the terminology preferred by anthropologists of contemporary South America, predation and familiarization, at least prior to European acculturation. So first, let's use Oviedo's anecdote as an entree into understanding early modern Spanish and more broadly European human-pig relationships. A quintessentially noble activity, hunting, was conceived of as, as a form of practice and proxy for war, integral to the tactics and ideologies of the ruling elite, bolstering, legitimating, and naturalizing neo-feudal hegemony. Hunting was so ennobling that commoner hunters employed in royal hunts were given the privileges of the gentry. The hunt produced three categories of actors, the chief huntsmen, vassals, and prey. Here are some vassal animals. Uh, among these vassals were professional huntsmen, gamesmen, kennel masters, falconers, and animal vassals who were carefully bred horses and dogs and tamed raptors who worked in falconry. The prestige of animal vassals dwarfed that of many humans, as did their superior diets, and there was a prescription against eating vassal animals, even if their relatives and husbandry could and would be killed for consumption. The other category in the hunting mode of interaction was the enemy or the prey, of whom the wild boar was the most prestigious type in medieval and early modern Spain and in many other parts of Europe. Though nobility figured as owners of, of large flocks and rentiers um, profited from taxes and tithes that were among the fruits of the livestock economy, livestock husbandry belonged to the realm of the plebeian whereas hunters and professional falconers and kennel masters were symbolically and sometimes juridically ennobled by their relationships with vassal animals, dominant opinion considered those who worked most closely with animals and husbandry as degraded by the relationship. Humanist pastoralism notwithstanding, shepherds along with others whose bodies were in close proximity to livestock animals, muleteers, butchers, tanners, peasants in general, were figures of derision among elites, and I would argue that some of these attitudes were internalized within peasant communities. Husbandry produced three categories of animals, livestock, servants, such as oxen and shepherd dogs, and vermin, such as sheep killing wolves. But I will focus on the first category, livestock, or in Spanish, ganado, which comprised the majority of animals living amidst human society. The livestock section of Gabriel Alonso de Herrera's much reprinted Libro de Agricultura from the 16th century offers a hierarchy among the herd animals. At the bottom were goats and pigs were the second to last. Um, to illustrate the differences in inner subjectivity produced by hunting and uh, husbandry, I'm going to give you an example from a 17th century hunting manual written by someone who became the chief huntsman for Philip III, but whose reminisce came from his time when he served the Marquis of Villanueva, Villanueva in the eastern part of Spain in Extremadura. In the 1620s, the, um, the Marquis' lands included dense forests, little alleys of, of um, streams, and slices of pasture land. 
where there lived a herd of about 15 or 20 wild boar sows, and they're 30 or so young. The huntsmen identified one of, the, one of these sows as their leader, or Gia, and wrote that she seemed to have, quote, reason and understanding because she did things that shocked all of us, seemingly against nature. He recounted how the boar had lived and, and her, her group had lived many months, even years, without anyone being able to kill any of them. They maintained their safety by ensuring that dogs, and these are his words, could not catch their scent, taking care to move with the wind in their face without taking a step or a path unless the wind was against them. The leader also protected the others while they wild, wallowed by circling around the mud hole. He wrote that the sow, in his words, made a fool of him on many occasions until finally his scent dog led him to a spot where he could stake out at night. And he wrote, quote, his legs and arms trembling from desire in the bright moonlight, he shot the powerful sow. Afterwards, quote, the others, the other uh, boar, not having a leader, stopped in the dense forest, waiting for the arrival of their now dead leader. And then I could hear them, he wrote, mourning and urging one or the other that she would take over and lead. When he saw the sow's corpse, he found a large and fat animal with an ear pierced by two bullets and surmised her earlier escape from death, quote, was the re reason that she lived with so much care. I should mention that this is just one of any number of reminiscences about noteworthy boars, but their incidence isn't because he had a good luck of coming across special sewage, but because the practices engendered by hunting created these opportunities for what I call deep observation, and even included sympathetic mimesis as the hunter matched his breath to that of the boar he was stalking. This recollection illustrates characteristics of intersubjectivity of hunter-prey relationships the recognition of individuality, the identification with prey, and a dynamic of engagement. By contrast, where hunting animals were appreciated for their individuality, livestock creatures were viewed as units of a collective. For instance, in the English treatise Government of Cattle, um, it is advised that, quote, among a herd of many pigs, ye must have diverse and sundry marks to know which is which, for else it will trouble his wits to know one from the other. And it's estimated that 80 to 100,000 hogs were farmed in oak forests um, in the Badajoz region. And individual herds could average around 600 in Spain. And if you're wondering, well, this would be different if you were a peasant. In fact, usually in, in village communities, there would be a swine herd who would be responsible for taking care of individual peasant families' herds for the day. So this kind of logic of the herd um, extended across different kinds of husbandry arrangements. Second, where hunting animals were seen as subjects with whom collaboration or competition was taken for granted, ganado or herd animals were objects to be managed, the passive recipients of breeding, feeding, fattening, curing, shearing, and slaughtering. And to save on time, I won't give you too many examples of this, but the discourse that we've been hearing, I think, survives very much into the present, and they have very clear antecedents in this period, if not earlier. And third, the practices and ideology that comprise the aristocratic hunt produced identification between hunter and boar, whereas alienation was central to relations with si livestock. The living livestock creature was figured as existing in a transitional state that would culminate in its death or the dispossession of its body parts. In alienation, the emphasis was not on the animal and people's shared traits, but rather on animals as products. In alienation, creatures were construed as vessels of disenchanted things. Cow bodies contained beef, cattle, candles, and leathers, sheep bodies, mutton, milk, and yarn. In this way, the living animal, cow, sheep, pig, goat, chicken, is a living carcass, um, and, it, and it is viewed and it is viewed that way even while it is alive as being sort of the before stage to its end state. And I could give you many examples of this, maybe the richest, and I'm going to be really, really quick. Obviously, we could spend a whole time just you know, doing a semiotic analysis of, of these really rich visual sources. But I think this gives you some sense of this alienation where you have different kinds of creatures all mixed up together. Um, and I mean, there's not much of their subjectivity um, on display. And even in the still lives that contain game animals, I would argue that some of the subjectivity is still there, that the depiction of just the boar head, you can sort of see the living, breathing, um, active boar, even in a composition where he is dead. Um, so very quick analysis over a much more complicated point. Um, so now we are going to fully understand the episode with which I started. We need to move to South America. 
Um, and I want to talk about taming practices there. So the, um, we've heard a lot of really interesting things about differences between domestication and taming, which I'm grateful for, so I, don't need, I can go over this fairly quickly. But the etic category, category here would be taming, or again, in the vocabulary of contemporary anthropologists, um, familiarization. And this is where um, indigenous peoples across lowland South America and the Caribbean would take an am animal from the wild and tame them. These were not bred in captivity. Their reproduction was not controlled. Um, but I think even more interesting is that um, actually the, the um, emic category, that should say emic, not etic. Um, and the, the example I have is that of the yeg, which comes from um, the Carib language group and examples from the 17th century and up to um, contemporary ethnographies. And some of the characteristics of, of the yeg is that it's a trans-species category. It could also be used to talk about um, an adopted child or a kidnapped child as well as a tamed animal. Um, the candidates who are eligible for eating are also eligible for taming. So in this way, it's very different than the European pet, though I do suggest that um, the genesis of the European pet might owe something to the yeg, since yeg historically predates the pet. But once tamed, eating is prescribed. Taming is also gendered female work. Um, and as is, as is the case with a newborn infant, subjectivity is endowed as part of the process of taming. And um, so to illustrate this in a hopefully quick and efficient way, um, I'll show you some uh, visuals from this amazing 16th century, late 16th century anonymous manuscript, the Histoire Naturelle des Indes, also known as the Drake Manuscript. And um, so here we have some depictions of people capturing um, parrots. And parrots and monkeys are probably the most obvious examples of yeg, but in places where there's a lot of um, uh, faunal diversity, a huge range of species are found. So um, I appreciate this image because it shows the symmetry between the, the yeg and the hunted prey, that, the, that either outcome is, is possible, um, sort of contingent, which is going to be the product. And here we have um, a domestic scene where you have Yeg hanging out, you know, the monkey here and the parrot over here. And finally, from um, Western Amazonia, a depiction um, of an Amazonian woman with her um, tamed monkey and parrot. And we see the, the sort of gendered associations quite clearly in this depiction. Here's a European um, trade. Europeans get brought into the system. Um, they're very keen on getting parrots and monkeys. Um, and so as I was doing research on this, at first I thought I was the first one to discover this phenomenon, but it turns out that anthropologists since the 19th century have been aware of it. There's a, and these are some of the um, anthropologists who are working on it, but the ethno-historical sources had not been exploited, so that's, I think, part of my contribution. Here's the yeg going back to Europe. Um, this is in a, a, oh, so the place where I want to end, how much, do I have any time left? OK, so is to give you a little thick description flavor of this. So one of my favorite accounts of this phenomena comes from a um, Jesuit who spent part of the early 18th century in, actually, well, uh, in the Orinoco region. He was around here. And um, he wrote, although there are no domestic animals among the Orinocans, there are nevertheless domesticated his ones who come to the savage nation that they give a particular name in order to distinguish those that are wild and tamed. You know, here he's aware that this is an ontological category for them. Among the Indians, there are always those animals converted into domesticates. They seize them in the forest for toys for their children or in order to trade them with other nations. These animals tamed by the Indians are incredible in how tame and manageable they come. And of the many species that he mentions, one of them are, um, are these are peccaries. And since peccaries were identified by Europeans as pigs, um, even though they're, of a, they're not of the same family, but they share a suborder, I thought it, was, it would be um, maybe sensible to end by talking about an instance of, of peccary familiarization. And this is from the 19th century missionary ethnographer Everard Bernard M. III, um, who lived among the, uh, the Weiwei in, in what is today Guiana. And he um, wrote, he's one of the first people actually to take systematic note of this phenomenon, an 1882 article entitled Tame Animals Among the Red Men of America. 
Um, he singled out peccaries, noting, quote, that they become very tame, too much so sometimes, for they follow their master wherever he goes, and sometimes even insist upon getting into his hammock. Um, and I, when I was reading more about peccaries in preparation for today, I found out that apparently within the first three days of their life, whoever is around, they will follow that creature for the rest of their life. So if it's a peccary, it's a peccary. If it's a human, it's a human. If it's a dog, it's a dog. Um, so you could see where this kind of hammock sharing behavior might originate from, from that point of view. And so to come full circle to our um, possibly native northern South American indigenous man, I see he's, his experience with these pigs is actually bringing together th at least three different cultural systems. He was born, I'm suggesting, in a community where this, these kinds of taming and yeg practices were common. He um, was then exposed to European cultures of hunting. And then under brutal colonial conditions, he brought together them in a sort of creative synthesis. And um, thank you very much. All right, well, first I want to thank you um, for organizing this fabulous con conference and including me um, because it's, I've just gotten so much out of this. I'm just really um, grateful. So the title of my paper is actually not the title in the, in the program. It's Memento Mori, Creole Pigs as Forest Phantasms on Hispaniola. And this project is really driven by oral history. Um, and included in, I, I, I've included um, a link in my paper to um, a, a YouTube video of the first um, anecdote that I start off with, if you're interested in seeing my um, backstage process and some of my informants. Gumercindo Cevala recounted to me the story of a harrowing trip home on his motorcycle to the small central frontier town of Banica, Dominican Republic, where he lives. Like most residents, Cevala is a small-scale subsistence farmer who raises goats, pigs, and cattle for a living. It was night and he was on his motorcycle until he was forced to stop due to a large felled tree which had fallen across the road upon which he saw a jabali, a feral boar with long whiskers. He grabbed his gun just as the animal disappeared, deciding that it had actually been a baka, um, a spirit demon prepared by someone for purposes of sorcery. These are people who've been turned into animals. The perplexing thing about this story is that all the Creole jabali pigs on the island were slaughtered at gunpoint by USAID in 1979 to 1982 due to fears of swine flu threatening the US pork industry. I argue that these apparitions, oops, I forgot about my PowerPoint. Um, there we go. I argue that these apparitions invoke a now vanished feral animal commons, which was shared for centuries by the French and Spanish colonies of Hispaniola Island, San Domingue, and San Domingo, which became Haiti and the Dominican Republic, lasting into the 20th century in the Dominican Republic. Due to the late arrival of sugar in the eastern portion of the island in the Dominican Republic, the forest and the feral animals remained largely intact far later than in San Domingue, um, today Haiti and Cuba, where intensive sugar plantation economies caused its demise by the mid-19th century. Um, feral hunting economy, this is a baka, a, 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 man, a boy turning into a pig. The feral hunting economy commenced in the 16th century provisioning smoked meat to corsairs. Extensive cattle ranching of semi-feral herds later expanded in the Spanish East, providing meat and oxen to the thriving plantation economy of Western, the Western French colony until the 1780s when the Haitian Revolution commenced. The thriving livestock trade links Hispaniolan contrabandists to Cuba, Jamaica, Venezuela, Colombia, Curaçao, and Ver Veracruz. The forest cover provided a free commons of wildlife and hardwoods into the 20th century, important supplements to the subsistence economy, which sustained the rural poor outside of unfree labor and the market economy for centuries, at a time when dark skin could easily be read as a sign of slave status. For Francisco Puello, writing in the 1890s, the true locus of Dominican identity was the forest, home of boars and dogs. A black pig sacrifice at the forest of Bois Caiman also commenced the Haitian Revolution, which freed the slaves and founded the independent nation of Haiti. Um, signifying freedom, if the pig is a beloved synecdoche for uh, the forest commons, it is not hard to see why, which is precisely why the beloved um, this is precisely why the USAID directed slaughter of all Creole pigs on the island in 1982 was such a calamity for the rural poor. 
Yet getting at the effective significance of the backwoods world of El Monte, the wilderness conjured up by the pig, however, requires moving beyond the feral livestock economy to consider storytelling as a popular or archive. The broader cultural significance of the Creole pig became apparent to me through stories I was told of phantasmic pig sightings of the Puerco Criollo. The baca is a changeling spirit, a person which has been transformed into an animal, most frequently appearing in the form of dogs, cattle, cat, or pigs. But the pig stands out since it's the only baca that is beloved. Baca are classed together as if, um, as if their embodied host is entirely irrelevant. This is not the case here, and the baca may be located on a visceral con con continuum from the most terrifying apparition, which is the dog, to the most cherished, which is the creole pig. I wish to argue that the baca pig narratives are haunting tales conjuring a deep sense of loss and nostalgia for creole swine that helps us discern a particular culture of intimacy with the pig and its associated emotional resonance. The pig's rooting behavior and its associations with the underworld may explain its link to the spirit world, rendering the creole pig baca more like a spirit double or a familiar than a demon, thus differentiating it from other baca revenants. These drinking tales about shapeshifter bacas are commonly told by plebeian men in the Haitian Dominican frontier, such as day laborers and sentries, butchers and cattle ranchers, for whom much of their everyday life is wrapped up with li livestock. Uh, especially in the central Haitian Dominican frontier, which was the front line of the 18th century cattle trade to Haiti, where cattle and pigs have formed the basis of a pastoral economy, um, which until the eight, 1970s was more closely tied to the Haitian cities of Anche and Port-au-Prince than Saint Domingo. One might say that these poor sign ghosts are archives of the visionary and the expectant, to quote Anne Stoller which reveal epistemic anxieties and effective tremors, traces of trauma that have found no ready outlet given the fact that the military forcibly carried out the, gun, the uh, slaughter at gunpoint. If I'm correct, these revenants get us closer to the lived experience of the 1979 pig slaughter on the island of Hispaniola and the deep emotional attachment smallholders felt to the patio pig, which was a junior member of the family and the bedrock of the subsistence economy. These persistent pig apparitions sh should thus be seen as a mode of popular resistance to the erosion of everyday life for the poor. As has been argued um, for African pastoralists, whose livelihood is intimately bound up with their animals. The significance of livestock in this case is not merely economic. In the Caribbean, pigs were, are a sign of the human condition. A constant everyday life, live presence in the patio, as well as the most prestigious food, which should be served at Christmas dinner and religious feast days or on Sunday, and the primary object of sacrifice in certain Afro-Catholic Afro rites and Vaudun. Creole pigs were indeed what Marcel Most would describe as total social phenomena things which, are, which contained all the threads through which the social fabric is woven. Invariably paired with cornmeal, a sign of indigeneity and autochthony, the family hog was fed and cared for by mothers and children and beloved as a food. No barnyard beast conveys home in the Caribbean like the pig does. This is nicely summed up in the Dominican proverb, el porco cimarrón sabe en, en el palo en que se rasca. The wild pig knows where he belongs. Unlike in Europe, where the pig has long been a sign of incivility, connoting filth, lust, and excess, the Caribbean pig, the Caribbean does not vilify pig, and in jokes and songs, they are often cast as surrogate people. And I contributed as my, as my pig memento a song about having sex with a Christmas pig, which is somewhere in, the, in our uh, conference archive, um, in which you can see the substitution. The scholarship on animals hinges on the wild domestic binary in ways that are problematic for the case of Hispaniola. The Creole pig was not a companion species in Haraway's sense, nor was recognition of their non-human personhood cause for suckling them as in Melanesia. However, practices such as faith healing or laying on hands, which are used for both people and livestock, indicate what Cohn has described as a trans-species ecology of selves. While there was human pig codependence and intimacy, they were not socialized into the world of humans, as were Fulani cattle or Andean guinea pigs. While a pig or two was kept around the house to eat leftovers and food scraps, um, as the offspring accumulated, they were left to roam in the forest. Um, yet even the feral mountain pigs, I have been told, came when called. Um, these practices involving the taming of wild animals may be a Taino legacy, as Marcy Norton has argued, which the Spanish adopted in the early colonial period. In the feral economy of Hispaniola, cattle and pigs became contrast contrastive signs of commodities and gifts. There appears to have been um, early on uh, uh, an occupational specialization within hunters, 
with the term boucanier applied to the mounted cattle hunter and chasseur to that of hogs, the latter um, remaining important after cattle hunting declined after the Haitian Revolution. Cattle became important transatlantic commodities, which were traded internationally um, to regional corsairs, to the sugar planters of Saint-Domingue. Um, and when, when specie was short, which was most of the colonial period, um, cattle or hides were swapped for slaves in, in the Dominican Republic. During slavery, pigs became a ubiquitous feature of the conuco or provision grounds, since slaves were rarely given meat. For slaves, the extraordinary f fertility of pigs enabled a steady protein source and ready cash in times of need. Rebecca Scott noted the importance of obtaining farm animals as slaves trans trans transitioned to freedmen, and pigs could serve as credit for loans. Ligon attests to the ubiquity of pig in Barbados, as well as the animal's enormous size, and its distinctly sweet taste, um, because they were fed on locust nuts, plantains, and fruit. In Jamaica, they were fed cocoa yams, or taro. While in the intensive sugar-producing islands, all meat became commodities, on Hispaniola, this was not the case for pig. Um, the pa family pig became an exceptional food, highly prized, their value accorded not by their exchange value, but rather due to their extension of hearth and home. While their offspring could be sold, the pig should ideally remain what Annette Weiner has described as inalienable possessions, kept out of circulation, their paths tracing the social networks of family and friends. Of all the animal kingdom, pigs may be Physiologically, the closest to humans. Pig valves are used in human replacements, and scientists have been studying harvesting pig organ organs for human transplants. Current xenotransplantation practices in involve cloning and genetically modifying pigs to make them more compatible with the human immune system. The close proximity of pigs and humans also makes them potential transspecies disease transmitters, which appears to be one of the reasons why when swine flu emerged in the U.S. in 1976, officials panicked, given the disease's resemblance to the 1918 um, pandemic, uh, the most deadly flu outbreak in world history. In 1982, to prevent the, the, the spread of classic swine flu or hog cholera to the United States, the U.S. government authorized um, USAID to slaughter all Creole pigs on the island of Hispaniola. Over the course of 13 months, the armies of Haiti and the Dominican Republic ventured into the interior where they butchered the pigs en masse, countering immense popular resistance with the threat of a bayonet. Observers lamented that it was the worst calamity ever to befall the Haitian peasant, since the pigs was the central axis of the subsistence economy. The pig slaughter signaled the beginnings of extreme food precarity in both countries. Due to a drop in the U.S. sugar quota with the rise of high fruc fructose corn syrup, um, which replaced sugar in processed foods, both nations shifted from traditional export crops to tourism in the Dominican Republic and export free trade zones um, in both um, countries. Assembling became the most important source of employment during the 1980s. In Haiti, the pig slaughter was the tipping point, culminating in peasant suicides and an exodus of refugees to the United States. In the Dominican Republic, things also went from bad to worse. In, 19, in 1978, Antonio Guzman was elected in a landslide, but soon landed the nation in a major corruption, corruption scandal, which left gov the government bankrupt, just as oil prices spiked and debt arrears forced them to turn to the IMF for emergency loans. Resulting stabilization measures sent food prices skyrocketing at a time when wages had sunk to some of the lowest in the Caribbean, in part to attract foreign investment, with bread riots eventually erupting in Santo Domingo by 1982. The pig slaughter catastrophe was um, hit the central frontier particularly hard um, because this was the small pig farmer belt on the island. Worse still, the pig slaughter arrived after a series of droughts, with le which left the population even more dependent on live livestock than ever. Until then, creole pigs had been the mainstay of the peasant subsistence economy. The French term marron, which uh, became maroon for runaway slave, came from the Puerco Cimarron, wild pig, which was the primordial for forest creature on both sides of the island. Creole pigs were extremely well adapted to their environment, thriving on palm fronds, worms, and grubs. They disposed of household food remains, such as yucca and plantain peels, their excrement providing the fertilizer for the conuco, and their, um, and their rooting loosening the soil for planting. For an initial cost of less than $10, their off offsprings could sell for 250 Although caring for the animals in, El, in the Monte was a male pastime, the Creole pig massacre became a largely a women's issue, in large part because, as some re men reported to me, they concealed their pigs from authorities in the mountains, whereas the family pig was harder to hide. 
Simone de Beauvoir, de Beauvoir has said that women's animality is more manifest than men's. This may help explain why the pig slaughter mobilized women en masse. Perhaps it is the pig's exuberant fertility that genders them female, or women's labor caring for the family pig that renders the sow contiguous with domesticity itself. The close proximity of pigs and humans can even extend to po pollution taboos, such as beliefs in Portugal that menstruating women can spoil sausage made um, during the matanza. Um, and in Japan, it's said that wild boars prefer a pregnant woman's fields, and shapeshifter boars can turn into one's mother. And in Haiti, it is the wrathful goddess of love, Erzeli Dantor, who requires a, a Creole pig for her sacrifice. Yet irrespective of the po popular prohibition against killing sows, especially the pregnant and their offspring, which are taboo to eat and it's said to make you sick, um, these were also killed in the slaughter, a fact that outraged owners. The family pig, like the Andean guinea pig, is gendered a female along several axes since it's associated with fertility, reproduction, the ghosts of the ancestors, and the spirit of the gift. During the swine flu, flu slaughter, women may have become particularly irate because they had fewer other options for generating cash than their menfolk and were more dependent on um, their pigs than, um, than men because of the nature of the matrifocal family in the Caribbean. Women, of course, were also the primary caretakers for the family hogs that lived off, off the family uh, leftovers. In their pitiful complaints to the authorities, they wrote, we are women who sustained our families from pig production, who are now destitute. Outraged at the government's orders, some women preferred to kill and eat their own pigs rather than hand them over to the troops. Irate protests, protests flew in, um, flowed in via telegram and petitions. In one letter signed by 102 uh, claimants from a humble section of Himani, a full third were women, which is very high when you consider that women don't, in the Dominican Republic, play a very leading role in civil society. This is why the government campaign to explain the rationale of the slaughter and, and to eat pork was aired on women's radio programs. Interestingly, while official correspondents used the term matanza, massacre, for the slaughter, officials frequently described it as a sacrificio de cerdos, a term which rationalized the violence since ritual slaughter is, of course, legitimate. Um, it, to add insult to injury and in an act of colossal bad taste, the Secretary of Agriculture hosted a seminar on African swine fever at an elegant colonial hotel in Santo Domingo where they served imported whiskey and ham, cheese, caviar, canapes, and bacon-wrapped meat tapas. The baka is a spirit in animal guise. This dual identity corresponds with the close relationship between pigs and the spirit world in Congo culture of Central Africa. Um, uh, uh, in Central Africa, um, the baka pygmies were renowned for their skills in felling the most prestigious of game animals, the elephant. However, they, f they relied far more upon the similarly tusked red bush hogs as an everyday pr protein source. Hunters must have visionary powers since they are said to walk with the game spirits when pursuing game. Indeed, hunters have privileged access to the spirit world. Um, since the forest harbors both human and animal souls, and band communities are often said to be linked not only by family ties, but co-guardianship of, of the tutelary spirits of the dead. And the forest is seen as um, both reciprocating par parent and ancestor. Spectral pigs also form a central part of Central African male initiation cer ceremonies into secret societies, and their sacrifice is key to activating certain, um, certain spells, which are in, um, nkisi, which are embedded with white clay, a substance marking the threshold bet between the living and the dead. The family pig is anomalous because it is an animal that is part of the family, which according to Mary Douglas would render the, be the beast taboo. Of course, even in the barnyard context, pigs are anomalous because they share human food, yet they also eat feces. They're associated with both life and death, the paragon of exuberant fertility while eating subterranean roots. They thus delve into the underground realm of beings where the dead reside. As Rene Girard explained the paradox, which is the essence of sacrifice, because the vi victim is sacred, it is criminal to kill him, but the victim is sacred only because he is killed. As he continues, in acts of sacrifice, the animal is a human surrogate because from the animal realm were chosen as victims those who were the most human in nature. This may explain the unusual fact that a cemetery was fashioned for the pigs murdered at the hands of the army. Pigs are the brunt of much rough teasing, as in the permitted disrespect of classic joking relationships that Radcliffe Brown described as those marking intimacy. Appropriately, okay. um, appropriately then, um, the most popular character in Dominican Carnival is the Lechon. Oops. Oops. Oh, did 
I pass my, oh, you, I guess you already saw it, is the lechon, which is, um, uh, which has become a, a, a national symbol of Dominican identity. It's a trickster figure with a porcine face, clothed in color, colorful rags, who carries a pig bladder with which he rip, whips children. As spirit doubles, these porcine baka revenants appear to have emerged during the food crisis that developed right after the Creole pig slaughter in the 1980s, as Reagan's Car Caribbean Basin Initiative intended to transform the Caribbean from a subsistence economy into a source of cheap labor. As Haitian labor was supposed to shift in, in ex to export free trade zones in the capital, lower tariffs imposed by the U IMF shock treatment eventually displaced Haitian staple foods in ha as Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, became the largest net food importer in Latin America. Given the dramatic erosion in food security since 1982, it should not come as a surprise that the Creole pig continues to haunt the border. A poignant reminder of better days for the campesinado I've not yet met one person who would admit to purchasing a white U.S. replacement pig, although I have been told that these paradoxically, this is interesting, were much more difficult to handle than the mansa or gentle habali. Indeed, I was told that the viciousness of these gringo pigs, they would eat your child alive if you let them, so you had to watch them constantly. Um, indeed, these tales of gringo man-eating pigs bear an uncanny resemblance to the vicious attack dogs brought in to hunt down runaway slaves and, rav and ravage them during the Haitian Revolution, a very different animal than the beloved family sow, but also seen as exogenous. So now we must return to the um, vexatious question of why the Creole pig continues to haunt the border in tales of male bravado by men like um, Sibala. Perhaps this vengeful revenant is bitter because there are no more Creole pigs to appease the da dangerous Petro spirits of the dead, and they, of course, are their preferred sacrifice. The pigs may have blanched to gray, the pallid color of phantoms and disease, as they became symbols of imperial extraction since the U.S. was, of course, behind the slaughter. Or perhaps the bl brutal mass slaughter of, at the hands of the army, which should have been instead a carefully executed ritual sacrifice for the gods, morphed the hardy, piebald creole pigs a into man-eating, grave-robbing, spectral cochon gris, gray pigs, the name of a notorious secret society in Haiti. Just as an act of sacrifice transforms the maleficent into the beneficent, this is Rene Girard, this act did the exact obverse, as the surrogate victim met its death and became the monstrous double. Zora Neale Hurston describes her visit to the terrifying cochon gris in Port-au-Prince, okay, um, two sentences, where instead of the devotional chromolithographs in the altar, she saw a large black stone with a chain to it. Reputed to be shapeshifter cannibals, the um, cochon gris have been seen at market with human fingernails instead of pig's feet. Since the Creole pig slaughter turned an icon of family comfort and nourishment into one of death, no wonder that these feral habalis continue to haunt the border returning with the rage and despair that is all too characteristic of the goddess Ursuli, who, who loved her croissant creole. I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> Cut off my last line. <laughs>